<coughs> Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is another one of our organizers, David, who's actually the prime organizer of this entire meeting, David Allison. Well, thank you very much. Once again, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. As you heard, my name is David Allison, and I'm going to talk a little about issues of analysis. In the prior talk, after Victoria got us going, uh, Kay Dickerson sort of talked about one of the areas of science in which there's the opportunity to not do so well or to do better. And I think we're going to see that, and the theme is that is if we look at each step in the scientific process, in each step there are opportunities for things to go wrong and opportunities to think for things to go better. Kay talked about the step of reporting, and I'm going to talk about the step of analysis a little bit more. One of the things I want to point out, as others have, is that to err is human. Um, this is not just about pointing out the errors of others and trying to be holier than thou. And so I wanted to start with one of my own errors. Uh, I make errors too, we all do. This comes from a paper that I think illustrates um, errors at their best, you might say, in the sense of it had a good outcome and I hope was handled well. So I published a paper with Scott Keith, who was my student years ago. There's Scott. And uh, this was about bias introduced in uh, BMI mortality analyses as a result of using self-report data. So we published our paper and that was fine. And then a few weeks later, we got an email that you hate to get, which is from a colleague, someone I didn't know, who said, I'm trying to reproduce your results and I can't. Now this was based upon publicly available data, so the individual could go and get the raw data that we had analyzed, and of course, you know, this is always a little frightening. So we said, okay, well, tell us what you're doing, send us your code, we'll send you our code, we both have the data because the data are public, let's figure it out. We went back and forth and we figured out what had happened was a, an interesting compilation of errors that first, the people who had contacted us were people who had published a paper previously putting out an equation for correcting self-reported BMI data. We had used their equation, and their equation, when they published it, had some transcription rounding type errors in it. Then we made some extra errors, just to push it further along, and so now we had errors on top of errors. We figured out both of our errors, and we worked together to publish a paper. And so I pointed out again, just to first a little humility to say, I'm not just trying to point out other people's errors, we make them too. Second, to show the self-correcting nature of science. Third, to show we can do it collaboratively. And fourth, to show how availability of raw data allows us to take these things into account and try to make things better. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why are we focusing on these kind of analytic errors, how we, meaning the group that I work with, stumbled into focusing on these kinds of errors, so a few case studies or examples, some extracted generalities and contributing factors, how not to go about, I think, addressing errors, which is equally important as to how to go about it, and then talk about potential solutions. So this is the basic thing. It's more or less a repetition of what I started off with this morning. Why address this? Because science is the answer. We talk a lot about bias in science, but in fact, science itself is a bias reduction technique. As Adam Smith put it, science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. It is about trying to tighten up our observations. It is about trying to make our modes of inference objective and reproducible. And so that's the answer. Um, but what if science itself is not rigorous? And this is an interesting quotation. Incipient and actual attacks upon the integrity of science have led scientists to, re to recognize their dependence on particular types of social structure. Manifestos and pronouncements by associations and scientists are devoted to relations of science and society. An institution under attack must re-examine its foundations, restate its objectives, seek out its rationale. Crisis involves, invites self-appraisal. Now that they have been confronted with the challenges to their way of life, scientists have been jarred into a state of acute self-consciousness. Consciousness of self is an integral element of society, and so on. This is very similar to some of the quotations and offered earlier today, some of the things Victoria cited in earlier papers. And you might think this was published in 2013 in Nature or something like that. In fact, it was written by Robert Merton in 1942. 
So the idea that there somehow sprang up a replication crisis in the late 2000s or in the 21st century is unreasonable. This goes back a long time. We can go back to history and find examples of every kind of concern we have about science today, we can find historical examples of. All right, how did I stumble onto this? Well, I work with a group of people at UAB, some of whom are here with me today, and you'll hear from some later, and we put out something every week called Obesity and Energetics Offerings, and it's a free thing, and you can go look it up on the web if you want and sign up, and every week we send out an email and it goes out to over 80,000 people and it includes usually more than 100 links to scientific papers. There's not a lot of commentary, it's just links and people seem to really like it. But in putting together over all those 100 papers, we find that we have to look at several hundred papers to decide what to include. And we're not reading several hundred papers, but we look at the titles and in many cases abstracts of several hundred papers every week. So every week I'm sitting at my desk looking at several hundred paper titles. And every once in a while I say, really? Is that possible? Could that be true? And sometimes I look a little further and I say, how did they do that? Does that make sense? And dig a little more and start to see, that doesn't make sense. And that's how we got into it. What we started to find is so many things that didn't make sense. And when I say did it make sense, we came up with this phrase, invalidating errors. So there are errors that we might, or disagreements we might have that are matters of judgment. Someone might use the Hamilton anxiety rating scale, someone else might use the Spielberger anxiety scale, and there might be a disagreement about which was better. We wouldn't call that an invalidating error, that's a matter of judgment. Somebody adds two plus two and gets five, we usually call that an error, and that may be an invalidating error if the decision about what two plus two equals is a fundamental conclusion of the paper. We found so many things that were invalidating errors. We started to write letters to the editor. In some, but not all cases, papers were retracted as a result. We developed a little compilation of these, and uh, I was going to call it a comedy of errors, but my colleague, Catherine Kaiser, who you'll hear from later, wisely said it's really a tragedy of errors, so we renamed it that. We submitted it to Nature. They, they published it, thankfully. And we talked about not only the errors that we had found, but also the process, the difficulties in correcting those errors. And I'm not going to dwell on that today, I may give one example, but what was striking is that we found great confusion and resistance, certainly resistance among authors, but confusion among journal editors as to what to do, how to do it, discomfort, unwillingness to act, delays in acting, and that's all written up in this paper here. All right, so now let me give you some of these case studies. And the point is to try to lead you to, to think about what is the magnitude of these errors, what are some of the types of errors that may help us think about uh, underlying causes. And here's one that I think speaks to the idea of trying to think about every single aspect of what we do and asking ourselves always, are we behaving in a way that I believe is consistent with the, the one uncompromisable principle of science? which is to be truth seekers and truth communicators. So at every moment are we speaking the truth. So this, this image is from an old book, 1954, Daryl Huff, How to Lie with Statistics. It's a fun read. You can read it on a plane in 30 minutes. Um, but it cues you into the idea that visual images can distort too. And I won't go into the details of that, paper, of that image, but uh, it's a fun read. And then this paper came out a couple of years ago on liraglutide, which is a, a drug used to treat obesity. It's a new drug. I'm not saying anything bad about the drug, but um, it was interesting that the drug produced a 7.3% reduction in waist circumference. And as you all know, circumference is, in a circle at least, proportional to diameter. And then this image came up, and I didn't animate it, but if you click on the website, there's a little video, and it shows that figure on the left taking a big syringe and injecting itself, and then it shrinks to be the figure on the right. And as I was looking at this, my, my middle school son was nearby, and I said, hey, have you got a ruler from school or something? Can, this doesn't look like 7.3% to me. Does it look like it to you? And he said, it doesn't look like it to me either. So we, we got the ruler out, and then later we figured out how to do with pixels, and we realized, no, it's an 11.3%. 4% reduction, which seems to be bigger than 7.3%. And I thought, well, that seems misleading. 
I don't think the FTC would allow that or the FDA. Why is New England Journal publishing this? So we wrote to New England Journal. We wrote a little article, a little you know, commentary, whatever, letter. And New England Journal said, you are absolutely right, Dr. Allison. We'll be more careful in the future, and we're not publishing your letter. So we put it up ourselves on PubMed Commons. But this just gives an idea of one of the many places where these sort of things can creep in. This is a paper we came upon a couple of years ago, modeling potential effects of reduced calories in kids' meals with toy giveaways. So the idea is that fast food restaurants, which have special packaged meals for kids, often include a toy, and have a certain number of calories. And the question was, what if you put in a policy that said the maximum number of calories such a meal could have would be X? And then you subtracted the difference between that and the average number of calories a meal does have. And then you multiply back out what kind of weight would that loss or less weight gain would that give in the average kid. So these people from the New York Academy of Medicine did that. And they used this thing called the 3,500 kilocalorie rule, which is this old rule that's commonly but inappropriately used, which says, well, there's 3,500 kilocalories in a pound. So to gain or to lose it, you just figure out how many more or less calories you're eating, and you multiply, and you go from there. And they came up with this that, you know, the average kid would lose about or gain less, about two less pounds per year. I thought, that, that seems a little ambitious to me, maybe plausible, I'm not sure. And then I read this part, and it said, calculations in the model include children who are estimated to eat fast food four or more times per day. Well, this alone starts to boggle the imagination. You're telling me there are kids who eat fast food 28 meals a week? Maybe, but I find it a little hard to believe. Um, and they say, though rare, such children would theoretically expect to avert weight gain of 27 pounds per year if a plan like this were put into place. But 27 pounds per year? A kid's growing 27 pounds per year? Even an obese kid growing? Denny Beers, the editor of AJCN and a pediatrician, maybe he can tell us that. But I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Have you been a kid? Have you seen a kid? 27 pounds a year from a, a smaller meal. So I called up Kevin Hall at the NIH. Um, the original article was retracted, by the way. Uh, and I said, Kevin, can you run this through your model? Because he's got the best mathematical model for in growing children for estimating the effects of different calories. It's a validated model. And he said, yeah, it's actually closer to about, um, where is it, about half a kilogram of excess weight uh, over a five-year period from age 7 to 12. So the authors were off by easily an order of magnitude. And so we wrote, um, we wrote a letter to the editor, and I, I really admire the authors. They did the right thing. I thought they would kind of apologize and just say, yeah, the numbers are smaller. But in fact, they actually retracted the paper. So I, I tip my hat to them of doing the right thing. Another common problem we've seen is regression to the mean. Some of you know that man featured there is Francis Galton. Galton was the um, first cousin of Charles Darwin. He was a eugenicist, a statistician. He's the man from whom we get the idea of regression as in regression analysis, initially called reversion. It was the idea of reverting to mediocrity. So very tall fathers have tall sons, but not as tall as they are. Very short fathers have short sons, but not as tall as they are. My son, by the way, is six foot one, really. It's kind of amazing. A little, that was, he, went, he shot past the mean, I think. Um, but uh, that's, that's where regression to the mean comes from. And so if you were to get a group of very tall fathers in, and then you said, we need to treat tallness, and we'll do something to them, and then we'll measure the tallness of their sons, and you found that their sons were a little shorter than they were, you should not conclude that your treatment is a good prevention of tallness in the next generation. What you have probably observed is regression to the mean. And yet we see regularly, as in some of the articles we've pointed out here, that people go into their childhood obesity prevention program. They don't want to do a randomized controlled trial or can't do a randomized controlled trial. They go into a school, they implement the program with the heavier children, and they say, guess what? At the end of the year, the heavier children weren't quite as heavy as they were at the beginning. Regression to the mean. And what we've shown is that in situations like that where people have actually concluded that their treatment had an effect, that we can say, we can show the exact same magnitude of change in just longitudinal studies of children where no treatment has been implemented and they're just followed over time. If you skim off the top ones, they tend to be less near the top later on. 
So getting people to think about regression to the mean is a little tricky. It's a, it's a weird concept. People often have trouble getting their heads around it. My own doctoral mentor, when I asked, well, what's regression to the mean, he said, he was both a statistician and a psychologist, and he said, regression to the mean means you can't commit suicide by jumping out of a basement window. So you can think about that for a while and realize it's a little hard to explain regression to the mean to these folks sometimes. All right. This is an error we're seeing a lot of. It's, we call it the DINS error. It was somebody named Brandon George in our group came up with that label. It stands for difference in nominal significance. And the way this one tends to go is most often we see it in simple randomized parallel groups controlled trials, but we see it in other contexts too, where people assign folks to, in one treatment, let's say you get the juice, and in the other treatment you get the placebo juice, and then we look at your cholesterol later. And what you find is in the treatment condition, cholesterol went down from baseline, and let's just say for the sake of discussion, P equals 0.049. And in the control group, cholesterol did not go down significantly after treatment, and P equals 0.051. And you say, down significantly here, not down significantly here, I have an effect. Any statistician in the room knows that's an illegitimate test. You need to test the between groups effect, but we see it a lot, um, and we've gotten some papers retracted as a result of pointing it out, and here's just some examples in which we've pointed it out. Another problem we see is in cluster randomized trials. This is very popular in political science, in public health science, in prevention research, when you need to do test interventions that occur at the level of groups quite often. So if you just want to test the juice on cholesterol, you can usually randomly assign people to the juice, and that's a better way to do it. But if you want to see what's the effect of implementing a program in a school, it's hard to just assign kids to that. You need to assign the entire school to it. So now you start to assign entire schools, and the important thing there is because you've now confounded kid with school, right? Every kid in a school gets what's in that school, or every person in the community gets what's in that community. You need to analyze things that take into account that randomization. But many people don't do that. They analyze the statistics as though each person is just a separate, independent individual. And lots of statistical theory and simulations show that that is completely invalid and often will lead to enormous increases in type 1 or error rates or false positive rates. We've written a paper discussing it. Here's the paper, um, and here's two examples where in the analysis people don't take clustering into account. We haven't done a formal analysis of this. My gut estimation is that probably close to a third of papers published in the literature using cluster randomized trials do not analyze the data properly. And this is an important thing here to recognize because Herein lies that teachable moment or that actionable moment. One of the things that we've done in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and Obesity Research, where at both places I'm an associate editor, is to say, if you see the word cluster, the phrase cluster randomized, please be sure to send that to me or one of the other statisticians so that we can check that out before it's published. And that's now happening, and so we've just caught one where it was already accepted by another associate editor, it was already in galley proofs, but not yet published, thankfully. And we said, that's not right. Let's catch it before it has to be retracted. And so once you recognize the specific problems that co-occur, you can potentially act on them. Meta-analysis, we heard a little bit about before. We see a lot of problems with meta-analysis and statistics. And my impression is the chief problem has to do with variance, that most non-statisticians don't intuitively grasp variance so well, and so the question of what is the variance that you're supposed to use is not so clear. What is the variance? There's, there are many variances you could use. Um, and I first got exposed to this actually many years ago when I stumbled on first this quotation from this wonderful book by Robert Abelson called Statistics as Principle of Argument. And Abelson says, distributions of standardized effect size, sometimes called Cones D, it's the mean difference divided by the pooled within group standard deviation, show that in domains of substantive research of interest, it is unusual for this magnitude measure to be as big as 1.0, quite rare to be as big as 1.4, and extraordinary for it to be as big as 2.0. All right, so what we're saying is 2 is extraordinary for any study. Then this paper came out of a meta-analysis 
of hypnosis as an adjunct to cognitive behavioral psychotherapy for obesity. And I don't know anything about hypnosis, but I study obesity, and they seem to be reporting some big effects. In particular, they found a mean effect size of 1.96, just about two, which we're told is extraordinary for even one study, yet this meta-analysis found a mean of what would be considered extraordinary. So that seemed extraordinary. So I said, let's pull every paper out and look at it. And so my postdoctoral fellow at the time, Miles Faith, and I did that. And what we found is there were multiple errors in the calculation of the effect sizes. And these errors often, but not always, involved insufficient understanding of the variance and how to calculate that. When we corrected those errors, the paper went, depending upon exactly how you did it, from having an effect size of about 1.96 to being more like 0.21 or 0.26 and being barely, if at all, statistically significant. This is another one. I won't go through the details, but basically we caught another error. It didn't look right. We looked at the figure. We contacted the authors. The authors were really nice. No fussing, no hiding. They just said, yeah, here's our spreadsheet. We looked at their spreadsheet and we said, you have a negative standard deviation. Okay? Standard deviation is the square root of a squared number. We're not dealing with imaginary numbers. Can't have negative standard deviation. So they didn't know how to calculate the standard deviation of a change score. So they had just took the difference in standard deviations. And so we said, well, that's not quite right. Let us help you. So we fixed it. We published it together. Again, it was very collegial. We showed that what seemed to be a significant effect for glucomannan of lowering body weight was not a significant effect of glucomannan for lowering body weight. Then there's some errors that I would call idiopathic. That is, I'm not really sure what these are, but it's maybe worth looking at to think about them and the process that uncovered them. This is one of my favorites. We observed a, a randomized controlled trial looking at the effect of meridian massage, and I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it's a type of massage, on body mass, uh, body mass index, waist circumference, and hip circumference in a sample of obese patients. And the authors had shown roughly a 10% drop in body weight in people who weighed at the beginning approximately 75 kilos as a result of massage. Now, I actually, about eight, and well, this was over eight weeks, and by sheer coincidence, about eight weeks ago, I decided I wanted to lose a little weight, and I did lose about 10% of my body weight in about eight weeks, and I happened to weigh about 75 kilos at the beginning. So if you think about that, that's actually a lot of weight. Usually with our best drugs and our best cognitive behavioral therapy in university clinics, we can get people to drop about 10% of their body weight in about three to six months. So to say in eight weeks, you got people who only weighed 75 kilos at the beginning, right? The people in our obesity clinics, they come in at about 100 kilos on average. That's pretty extraordinary. So we looked at the data and we noticed they had the, the body weight at the beginning, the mean body weight, and at the end in each group, and they had the mean BMI at the beginning and at the end for each group. And as you probably know, BMI is weight over height squared. So everybody knows the ratio of means is not the mean of ratios, but if you use geometric means, they're pretty close. So we did a little fancy math with some approximations using geometric means, and we showed that in order for these results to be true, the average adult in this sample would have had to have grown six centimeters in height in eight weeks. Since most adults don't grow six centimeters in height in eight weeks, we thought this was unusual. We wrote to the authors, and as perhaps Keith Baggerly will tell you later, not surprisingly, we didn't get any response. We wrote again and didn't get any response. So then we wrote to the editors. The editors then got a response from the authors. The authors simply said um, something was wrong, and they produced new results in which the weight losses were about half what they initially were. Never explain what had happened, but at least this shows that the idea of thinking things through mathematically, I think, often leads to the detection and correction of lots of errors. This is another one involving randomization, kind of idiopathic. We don't know what happened. This was published in the Journal of Paramedical Sciences, um, and it was a randomized controlled trial of the effect of a food service worker uh, program on body mass index. It seemed to show positive results. We looked at the baseline levels, 
Now remember, these are people randomly assigned to different groups. So on average, they should be similar for all baseline characteristics. You get some chance deviations, that happens. Um, but the p-value listed by the authors themselves for the baseline body weight difference was listed as 0.00. .00. So we actually took the means and standard deviations reported. We did our own t-test. And we found out that the p-value for the difference was not just a within rounding that, but it was 1.9 times 10 to the minus 17. So this is kind of close to the inverse of the number of protons in the universe. And we think about this, that is, this number is so small that if every one of the 7 billion people on the planet did their own randomized controlled trial and tested 1,000 separate endpoints, and then did a bon we did a Bonferroni correction for the 1,000 times 7 billion statistical tests, it would still be statistically significant. And so we thought, well, this seems implausible. So again, we wrote to the editor, the, letter, the authors, they didn't respond. We wrote to the editors. The editors finally said, um, due to lack of cooperation to provide the data used in the article, uh, we've retracted it. So this, again, I think partly goes to the idea of standards. And here we have some courageous editors who said, if the standard is, if there's a question about your paper, you need to let somebody look at those data and confirm what's what. And if you don't do that, we'll retract the paper. I think this was a good call on the editor's part. Now, it doesn't always work so well. Some people more successfully resist the self-correcting nature. So a paper was published by some other authors. And this was interesting because it was a methodologic paper talking about how to analyze cluster randomized, design and analyze cluster randomized trials. Excuse me, which as I've said before, is an area that people seem very confused about. And these methodologists themselves made some statements that I believe to be incorrect. And again, these were not statements of judgment. These were statements that I believe to be verifiably and knowably incorrect from a mathematical basis that are already well established in the statistical field. So I went to a few of my colleagues who are experts in randomized controlled, cluster randomized trials, and I said, do you think I'm confused or have I got this right? And they said, no, you're not confused. You're correct. The statements these other authors have made are simply wrong. And so we said, hmm, that should be corrected. So we wrote a letter to the editor. Um, and we said, we think that these statements are wrong. It was in a journal called Obesity Facts. We, think, we said, we think these statements are wrong. Uh, we think it's misleading to readers. We think because these statements are the fundamental conclusions of the paper, that the paper really ought to be retracted. The editor sent our commentary to a third statistician who said, yeah, these guys in Alabama are right. The paper is wrong, should be retracted. They then sent the materials to the author and said, we think the paper should be retracted. And the author said, mm, no. And the editor said, OK. The editor then published this entire, so everything I'm telling you is public, because the editor then published this whole story as an editorial to go along with our commentary that it should be retracted, the author's rebuttal, and so on. So maybe we'll change the name of the journal to Obesity Fiction instead of Obesity Facts. Um, Extracted generalities and contributing factors. One of the things we're seeing is that there are some themes that emerge. One is that poor or non-mathematical thinking seems to come out. A lot of these mistakes come out when you just sort of stop and think mathematically for a little while. Like, can these things add up? What happens if I calculate the height change needed? What happens if a kid did this difference in meals for 10 years? Would they disappear? These kinds of things allow you to think about um, finding some errors. The DIN's error, the difference in nominal significance, whoops, seems to be a common one. Um, Meta-analytic effect size calculation seems to be an area of problem. So I think we need to get people past the idea that there's some software out there, which there is, that you can easily plug your effect sizes into and then inexpensively produce research papers because meta-analyses don't require a big grant to run subjects. We need to get people away from that thinking and think, if you're not a trained statistician or don't have someone with statistical training on your team about meta-analysis, effect size calculation, you probably need to get someone before you do that. Just because you can throw the numbers in the software doesn't mean you've thrown the right numbers in the software. 
Cluster randomized trials is clearly an area where we need more education. And I would basically say, and I say this to myself, even as a statistician, I'm not an expert in cluster randomized trials. I would not design and analyze a cluster randomized trial without bringing on board another statistician who is an expert on cluster randomized trials. Not understanding regression to the mean is clearly an area where we need to do more education. And misunderstandings about randomization and how it's connected to frequent statistical uh, significance testing. Not something I got into a lot, but I think these are some of the common areas we see. There are, I think, some factors that lead to um, some of these breaches in reproducibility and rigor. I'm not going to talk about this very much. I think some others will. We heard about earlier the motivational set, incentive structures, and so on. I'm not going to talk much about cognitive biases. Again, I think some others will. But I think here's sort of the more obvious ones. Ignorance. People make mistakes because they don't know how to do it right sometimes. People make mistakes because they have insufficient or biased checks. And that doesn't imply any malfeasance. Bias, think checks can be biased just because of the way we tend to think about things. When we get a result we expect, we tend not to check it so much. When we get a result we don't expect, we check the heck out of it. And then we often find things are wrong, but we may not find things are wrong on the things that were in accordance with our preconceived notions. And limited resources. We may not check because we just don't have enough statisticians, enough money to pay them, uh, enough money to pay graduate students, enough time, so on. Ignorance. So one, obviously, is lack of or ineffective training. Uh, Trevor Butterworth is here, and he's going to talk, I think, a little bit later about some of his ideas about new training opportunities he wants to pursue or is pursuing in statistics. Others are working on that. I also think there are errors of interdisciplinarity, which is a phrase, to my knowledge, we've, we've coined, that I think is very challenging. Uh, it's a big challenge for us today. Not quite sure how to address it, but I think it needs to be brought up to the fore so we can think about it. This is the idea that, you know, it sort of harkens back to Rumsfeld's The Unknown Unknowns. This is the idea that it's hard for me to ask the question of whether I'm doing something right if I don't even know what it is I should be asking about. And as one example, we looked at a paper, we published a paper about a year ago on the New York City stop and frisk data and whether people were more likely to police were more likely to stop and frisk people with different BMIs and, and treat them differently and so on. And when I looked at the BMI data, they were just terrible. They were sort of all over the maps with one person who was reported as having weighed 7,000 pounds. And we know that wasn't true. And so, you know, I said to my colleague, who's a sociologist, could you give me the protocol of where, how the data were the measured and all? And she said, it's not in the publicly available data file and documentation. I said, well, call up these other authors who analyzed it and published a paper, these sociologists. They must know. So we called them up, and they're sociologists, and they weren't regularly obesity researchers. And they said, wow, that's a really good question. How were the data measured? I thought, a really good question? You published a paper on high when you didn't ask how it was measured? So, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, as an obesity researcher, I would never make that mistake. But if I were working with someone else on GIS data, and they said, David, here's the file, here's the GIS things, and here's the BMIs, I'd probably ask how the BMIs were measured. And I don't think I might not stop to ask until I've now thought through this, how was the GIS data measured? Just, well, GIS data are clean. Everybody knows where GIS data come from. They're pure. Well, that's because I don't know much about GIS. And if I were working with someone who was an expert, they would probably say, you better figure out where those GIS data came from and whether they meet standards. So I think real, uh, trying to find ways to ask which questions we need to ask is important in interdisciplinary work. Limited resources, tremendous. We all work on deadline. It's been said, were it not for the last minute, none of us would get anything done. Um, so we work on deadlines. You know, you submit your paper to JAMA. JAMA takes nine weeks to review it. Then they send you a thing back if you're really lucky. And they say, we're interested in your paper. Please return it to us with these 16 single space pages of comments addressed in three weeks. Well, that come, might invite a few errors. Um, limited training, limited money for statisticians, um, limited personnel availability. I will say here, in case there's a young statistician in the audience, I am desperately trying to hire a new full-time statistician. I have money to hire a new full-time statistician. <laughs> trying to find a new full-time statistician is not so easy. Okay, insufficient checking. 
I'm not going to go through these three papers in details, but they're interesting. These were three papers that were either corrected or, in one case, retracted, in which you have here, this one says, um, the interpretation of the coding of political attitudes in the description of preliminary analyses portion of the manuscript was exactly reversed. So people just had it coded negatively, and so the conclusion, you know, whatever it is, A goes up with B, it was really, oops, sorry, A goes down with B. Um, this one says, uh, after Bent and colleagues article, this was about ephedra and uh, herbal products, and, and I, I'll disclose that I was in legal proceedings looking at this, so I've been a paid consultant in that area. These guys looked at some poison control data, and they got this big sort of quasi-relative risk, and then after publishing it, um, what it doesn't say here, but is because this came out in cross-examination, it was found out that they actually analyzed the wrong data set, or an ins incomplete data set, and the result had to be brought down by an order of magnitude. Um, so we have coding it negatively, analyzing an incomplete data set, and here um, another one. These data were not reverse scored as intended prior to analysis. As a result, the conclusions in the discussion were incorrect. So again, the conclusions are exactly backward of what they should have been. This one is sort of, you know, a nightmare. And I think these are things where I don't think in any case this was malfeasance. I don't think this was incompetence in the sense of unintelligent people who didn't have good training. I think there was just some insufficient standard operating procedure to catch these kinds of things. All right, how not to go about trying to fix this? I don't want to dwell on this, and another disclosure. This person, I don't know the person up there who's, who's writing this on his blog, but the person he's writing about is a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, so you can take that for what it's worth. And this is commenting about a case that's active, and you can find it on the web right now, actively being discussed. And it involves a case in which a prominent researcher's papers are being questioned. And the question is, have are, there been some mistakes in these papers? And there may or may not be. That will come out in the fullness of time as these are evaluated. But what's essentially being ha what's happening is, um, I think, character assassination and essentially trial by media. So this individual's reputation, the person who's being scrutinized, is being attacked. Now, if that individual has made some honest mistakes, then he should correct those honest mistakes. If he's made some mistakes that are not honest, then he should suffer with the consequences of that, and I don't think he has, but I think that fair game, that needs to be discussed. But just as in any case, we would not call up a student in front of our class to say, let me just talk to you, Mr. or Ms. X, in front of everybody here and say that I have looked over your tests on the most recent midterm, and I think you cheated. We're going to have a full investigation. You, as a professor, had you done this, would be in great trouble for violating this student's privacy. Say, there is a way to bring forward a concern about honor and integrity, and it is done privately, and there is a process, and we go through that process to preserve the reputation of the accused until things come out. This is the exact opposite, and I think it's particularly interesting to read this part. You know, a person says, why am I doing this? And he says, it wasn't that long ago that I was a PhD student sitting in a room full of inept professors with pompous superfluous titles who ended my academic career, and now I'm here returning the favor. And I have to ask, is this the culture we want to foster? And for me, I can clearly say no. So I think we need to go through moderated kinds of procedures, go through editors, go through uh, misconduct boards if necessary. All right. I think we want to come up with appropriate ways of responding. By the way, all my slides, I'll be glad to send them to anybody. Um, and Susan Fisk, this comes from some commentary about a paper she wrote. And again, I think she's going to comment about that. So I, I tip my hat to her as introducing this idea of the need to think about how we raise these issues. And finally, in terms of potential solutions, I, I wrote a letter to the editor in Science years ago that was published talking about the antidote to bias in research being put out the raw data. Um, by putting out the raw data, we've been able to find errors and get papers fixed or retracted. I think the value of checklists is crucial. I think we need workflow uh, things that go through the entire process and find each point at which things can be fixed.
We need better education. We need to buttress the resources, particularly of statisticians and their availability. And at this point, I will simply say thank you.